from the chat. All right, welcome back everyone. In the interest of keeping us on schedule, uh, I get the privilege of moderating the, our final panel for the afternoon and of also, you know, the old joke of not wanting to be between you and food or you and the exit, uh, we will try to keep mo things moving briskly along. Uh, now, I've been told by both our speakers that there is a bit of a misnomer in the title of the panel in terms of can government can spell, compel speech uh, by designating it as its own, uh, but we will let uh, both of them describe their specific arguments uh, themselves. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce uh, Helen Norton, Associate Professor of Law at the University of Colorado School of Law. Uh, actually, both of our speakers are uh, recipients of teaching awards, uh, which I wanted to highlight because so, so often uh, we forget to do so in our profession uh, with our focus on our scholarship. Uh, she holds a JD from Bolt, Hol uh, Bolt Hall School of Law at the University of California at Berkeley, uh, where she was the associate editor of the California Law Review and a BA with distinction from Stanford University. Uh, just recently in 2008, she was the leader of President-elect Obama's transition team charged with reviewing uh, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and is frequently invited to testify before Congress on civil rights law and policy issues. Uh, to her right is Professor Abner S. Green, the Leonard F. Manning Professor of Law at Fordham University School of Law. Uh, he, as I said, also he is also a recipient of the Teacher of the Year Award and is a graduate magna cum laude from Yale College and summa cum laude from Michigan Law School and clerk for Chief Judge Patricia Wald of the D.C. Circuit and Justice John Paul Stevens of the U.S. Supreme Court. So please join me in welcoming uh, both our speakers. Uh, Professor Norton will be our first speaker. Good afternoon. Thanks so much, Raymond, and, and thanks to the Law Review for having us out here. This has been a terrific event, and I've learned a great deal already, and I'm really delighted to have been a part of it. Uh, given that I'm one of the last two speakers of the day, I'm going to take advantage of your fatigue and try to pull one over on you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with a few minutes that directly address the subject of the panel, uh, can government compel speech by designating as its own? But then I'm going to spend the remainder of my time by talking about a, a different topic, although happily it is a topic that's related to government speech. All right. So first, a few minutes uh, more directly addressing the topic of this panel. We talked a little bit about the Garcetti case this morning. And just to refresh some folks' recollection, uh, Garcetti involved a First Amendment challenge by a prosecutor, a government employee, who was allegedly punished because he wrote an internal memorandum criticizing the behavior of the police department. And he alleged that this was a violation of his First Amendment rights, especially in light of the importance of this sort of speech, shedding light on possible police improprieties to the public. And in Garcetti, the Supreme Court held that public employees are not at all protected by the First Amendment with respect to their speech that they make pursuant to their official duties. In other words, if their jobs require them to express themselves in some ways, that speech is the government's, for which the government has paid with a salary. And it's the government's, entirely the government's, to control so that that speech can be punished, according to Garcetti, without, uh, free from First Amendment scrutiny. Now, I've written about this at length in an article um, that the, the, the Law Review editors were kind enough to, to include in your material. So if you're all more interested in this in particular, um, I invite you to read it. Or if you need help getting to sleep, I invite you to read it. But, but my, my parents tell me it's riveting. So, and they're very, they're very honest people. Um, under Garcetti, the outcome in many cases involving public employees who are fired or otherwise punished for their on-the-job speech now turns not at all on whether the public is interested in the information they have to offer, nor any real or imagined injury to the government's uh, work as an employer. Instead, after Garcetti, the outcome largely turns on whether or not the contested speech fell within the plaintiff's job duties. If it did, it is unprotected. So Garcetti permits the employer, the government employer, to claim the on-duty speech of its employees as its own. This is a 2006 decision. Now, four years later, we have many dozens and, and approaching hundreds of examples of cases in which lower courts routinely apply Garcetti to dispose of government workers' First Amendment claims at great cost to the public's interest in government transparency. And the examples include uh, the rejection of First Amendment by claims by police officers fired for truthfully reporting public officials' illegal behavior police officers fired for accurately reporting health and safety violations on the job, Healthcare workers disciplined for conveying concerns about patient care, teachers punished for describing concerns about student treatment, public financial managers fired for re reporting fiscal irregularities. And after Garcetti, 
All of this speech is unprotected by the First Amendment because it was pursuant to these public employees' job duties and their First Amendment claim fails. Now, I certainly agree that government speech is valuable, enormously valuable, but Garcetti means the rejection of government workers' First Amendment claims in a growing number of cases that undermine the public's interest in transparent government as well as the, the government workers' free speech rights. And in other words, Garcetti has encouraged courts to defer to government's claim to control the speech of its workers as its own. Even more troubling, I want to flag two recent developments that illustrate lower courts' willingness to extend this idea to limit free speech rights far outside of the public employment context. And just as we saw in Garcetti, in both of these cases, courts were very quick to define the government's speech interests very broadly, and these courts were quicker still to perceive individual speech as threatening the government's own expressive interests. First, the Fifth Circuit recently invoked government speech concerns to justify the regulation of student speech by a public school. In this case, the Fifth Circuit rejected a public high school uh, student's First Amendment challenge. The student had been dismissed from the cheerleading squad when she failed to cheer for a basketball player that she alleged had sexually assaulted her. When this player was at the free throw line, she did not cheer. She folded her arms and she remained silent and she was dismissed from the, the cheerleading squad. Uh, at the time of this incident, a grand jury had refused to indict the player. He was later indicted on a felony charge of sexual assault and he ultimately pled guilty to a misdemeanor charge. But the Fifth Circuit threw out the cheerleader's First Amendment claim, characterized her as contractually required to cheer for the basketball team, and thus she was a mouthpiece through which the school could disseminate its speech, namely its support for its athletic teams. And then the panel then concluded that the plaintiff's conduct constituted substantial interference with the work of the school and rejected her First Amendment claim. Now, I agree that the government often has a substantial interest in protecting the message that it seeks to disseminate. But I think a thoughtful analysis in this case would have considered whether or not the young woman's silence, without more, posed any real threat to the school's own interest in supporting its athletic team, and whether any th such threat, if it existed, and I doubt that it did, but whether any such threat outweighed the First Amendment value of the student's own speech. And unfortunately, the Fifth Circuit considered neither. My second example is a case in which the Supreme Court recently denied cert. It's called Weiss versus Casper. And this is a case in which the lower court invoked government speech concerns to justify the exclusion of non-disruptive private citizens from an official government function based purely on their viewpoint. And this was a First Amendment challenge by two individuals who were forcibly ejected from a speech by then President Bush. And this was a public speech, it wasn't a campaign uh, speech. They were forcibly ejected from the speech because they arrived in the event's parking lot in a car that had a bumper sticker that said, no blood for oil. They were targeted because of the bumper sticker as potential troublemakers. They did not create trouble. They remained silent, but they were ejected because their bumper sticker suggested they disagreed with the president's views. The federal district court found no First Amendment violation using language that suggests a very broad understanding of government speech interests, quote, President Bush had the right, at his own speech, to ensure that only his message was conveyed. When the president speaks, he may choose his own words, end quote. And the Tenth Circuit affirmed on qualified immunity grounds, citing, among other cases, the Supreme Court's recent decision in Pleasant Grove that we've just heard a great deal about. Now, I agree that the government speech doctrine certainly permits President Bush to control the content of his own speech. I agree that it certainly permits him to refuse to share his podium or his microphone with dissenters or with anybody else, for that matter. But I, I, I would argue that the government's expressive interests, his expressive interests, are no way threatened by the mere presence at his speech of parties who may disagree with him, especially in this case, who disagreed with him silently. Now, Justice Ginsburg expressed bewilderment with this decision when she dissented from the denial of cert, and, and Justice Sotomayor joined her. Quote, I cannot see how reasonable public officials could have viewed the bumper sticker as a permissible reason for depriving the plaintiffs of access to the event. So these cases, the Garcetti case, the public employment cases since then, the cheerleader case, the bumper sticker case, these all involve courts that were very quick to define the government's speech interests very broadly, and quicker still to define individuals, individual speakers as threatening the government's expressive interest. Um, Professor Shower in his remarks uh, uh, talked about my interest in balancing. And sometimes I like balancing, and I, sometimes I don't. So how's that for balancing for you? <laughs> but, 
But for sure, for sure, I reject the Garcetti Bright Line Rule. And Garcetti is a bright line rule. If you're a public employee speaking according to your job functions, you are not protected by the First Amendment. I vastly prefer balancing to that bright line rule. And balancing, in my mind, would be assessing whether or not the public has an interest in what the, the, the government worker has to say. Certainly the public does have an interest in police misconduct. And balancing that against any threat to the government's expressive interests. And I would have liked to have seen the same sort of balancing in the cheerleader case uh, uh, as well. And I don't think you need balancing at all to conclude that folks who are silently attending a president's speech uh, but secretly disagreeing with him, I, I think it's, it's an easy call to conclude that they are not threatening the government's speech. Okay, um, now with all of this background, uh, those are the reasons I'm fairly critical of the Supreme Court's government speech doctrine to, to date. I think the court has been too quick to character, characterize contested speech as the government's. But in fact, in many occasions, and this is what I'm about to switch subjects to, I'm, I'm a big fan of government speech. And with a few exceptions, I actually believe that the more government speech, the better in many respects. Not because the government is always right, sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't, but because I think it's very important for the public to know what the government is thinking and saying. And the more the government talks to us about what it's thinking and doing, the better. So, so far, the Supreme Court's government speech doctrine has been focusing on untangling competing claims to the same speech by private and governmental speakers. And this was the Pleasant Grove case, right? Both the government, both the city, and some of them were claiming the monuments. Did the, did the monuments express the government's view or did the monuments express the views of the private donors? That case and the other government speech cases to date are about untangling competing claims to the same speech. Because if we characterize the speech as private, then the free speech clause kicks in and the government can't discriminate on the basis of viewpoint. But if we characterize the speech as the government's, the Supreme Court has held, and I agree with this, if it is in fact the government's speech, the government can control its own viewpoint because the government has to express itself if it is to govern. But assuming, if we put those sorts of controversies aside, if we assume that the government's claim to certain speech as its own is uncontested, and that the expression thus constitutes government speech, I am now interested in what I anticipate may be the next generation of government speech challenges. I'm interested in examining whether the Constitution limits the government's ability to address certain topics, certain subject matters. Now, as we just heard, certainly the Establishment Clause offers one independent check on the subject matter of government speech. Although, as, as we've also heard, the scope of that check remains contested. And in other projects, I'm looking at other possible subject matter checks on government speech. For example, I'm exploring the possibility of constitutional constraints on government's deceptive, deliberately misleading, false speech. Uh, and in another project, uh, looking at whether or not government's racist speech, that is pure speech without any operative content, is constrained by the Constitution. The examples I have in mind is the fact that for many years, southern states refused to excise their anti-miscegenation statutes from their codes, even though it was perfectly clear those statutes were unenforceable. They had no operative content under the Equal Protection Clause. But was their refusal to remove them from the code books uh, an act of government expression that violated the Equal Protection or some other constitutional clause? So those are other parts of this ongoing project. Today, I want to focus on another possible content-based limitation on government speech, and here it's on what I call government's campaign speech. When, if ever, does the Constitution constrain government's advocacy on contested policy matters that are subject to vote? Now, with respect to private individuals, private corporations' campaign speech, many policymakers and commentators have suggested that such speech may be sufficiently unique to justify special or different First Amendment rules, and Professor Schauer, for example, has used the term electoral exceptionalism to refer to this notion that maybe election speech is different or should be different for First Amendment purposes. And here I'm interested in exploring when, if ever, government's campaign speech is sufficiently different or unique to justify a departure from the general rule that government's own expression is insulated from free speech clause review. And here, for the purposes of this talk, I'm defining government's campaign speech for these purposes as government speech that expresses a position on contested issues, issues subject to vote by members of the public through initiatives or referenda, or by their elected representatives. And I'm putting aside for today the notion of government speech on candidate campaigns, in part because there are plenty of statutes that prohibit that already, at least the use of official government uh, resources for that, and because I do agree that that's different and more troubling. So I'm just focusing on issue campaigns here. And examples uh, I'm thinking of include government agencies' reports and analyses that are critical or supportive of pending ballot or legislative measures, 
uh, as well as government-related flyers, pamphlets, newsletter articles, website postings, press releases, and the like. All statements or forms of expression that communicate the government's view of a pending ballot or legislative measure to the public. And I'll give you some more specific examples in a minute. Now first, I, I plan to briefly to offer you some specific examples of government's campaign speech that some folks have found objectionable and why. And then second, I want to very briefly respond to those concerns and to preview my conclusion. I argue that transparently governmental campaign speech, meaning we know it comes from the government, we're not confused about its source. Transparently governmental campaign speech does not pose any greater threat to constitutional values than private parties' campaign speech. And in fact, transparently governmental campaign speech is often of enormous value to the public, especially but not only as a counter to less accountable and often less transparent, powerful private speech. So first, some examples of, of controversies over what I'm calling government's campaign speech. And for many years, both state and federal courts routinely upheld plaintiffs' challenges to government's political participation in these contests. And these courts, interestingly, did not identify a consistent legal source for their discomfort, although they were clearly, dis clearly uncomfortable. Many grounded their resistance to government's campaign speech in state and local government law that limited the powers of certain state and local agencies. But others pointed to the free speech clause, some to the guarantee clause, and others to unidentified and maybe structural constitutional sources. So here's some examples that might be helpful. Among the earliest and subsequently most influential opinions in this area was one by Justice-to-be William Brennan when he was still serving on the New Jersey Supreme Court. And there the defendant's school board had appropriated a few hundred dollars in public funds for a booklet that urged voters to support a bond initiative that would have financed the expansion of the school buildings. And the booklet argued in the board's opinion that the expansion was necessary to ensure adequate facilities for the town's children. And opponents of the initiative challenged this expenditure. In language that proved persuasive to many later courts, Brennan characterized government speech that took a position on contested ballot issues as fundamentally unfair to those with different views. He called it an affront to simple justice and fairness. Certainly many other courts felt the same way. Here's an example from a Florida court. Quote, the appropriate function of government in connection with an issue placed before the electorate is to enlighten, not to proselytize, end quote. Now many of these challenges did involve government speech on pending ballot measures, and most of those ballot measures involved the financing of public schools, public parks, other government programs. But also these, these arose in other situations as well, and one of the most controversial uh, had to do with a series of challenges to government agencies' expressive support for ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment when that was still pending. A New York State court, for example, enjoined the State Human Rights Agency from advocating in support of the ERA because it argued, this, the state court argued, that only totalitarian governments take sides on contested issues. Now note that many of these courts focused specifically on government agencies that spent money to disseminate their views. For example, in New Jersey, $318 on the booklet. They saw the expenditure of public money as the threat or potential threat to fairness and democratic values. But there's some that objected to any governmental deviation from neutrality, any indication that the government was taking sides in a contested debate, regardless of whether or not that expression required uh, any sort of public investment. Now, to be sure, there are folks and courts that felt very differently, considerably more comfortable with government's campaign speech. And if we offer as just one example, Justice Brennan himself, who later, once he was on the United States Supreme Court, embraced the value of government's campaign speech. There he stayed a state court's order that had enjoined the city of Boston from spending public funds to take a position on a pending ballot referendum related to property taxes. So this is 20 years after he had repudiated government's persuasive efforts with respect to school bond initiative. Now Justice Brennan emphasized the value of government's voice in informing the public of its views on a measure that the public would be asked to vote on. And he was especially interested in the government's role, a potential role, in countering or responding to the speech of powerful private parties who were very much engaged in that campaign. Quote, corporate industrial and commercial opponents of the referendum are free to finance their opposition. On the other hand, unless I grant this stay, the city is forever denied any opportunity to finance communication to the statewide electorate of its views in support of the referendum as required in the interests of all taxpayers, residential as well as commercial." End quote. Another example of a court very comfortable with government's campaign speech. This is a California court that rejected 
a First Amendment challenge to the state agency supporting, state human rights agency supporting the Equal Rights Amendment. Quote, if the government cannot appoint a commission to speak on the topic without implicating the plaintiff's First Amendment rights, it may not address any other controversial topic. And if the government cannot address controversial topics, it cannot govern, end quote. That, that's a dated campaign. These debates continue today, however. Uh, for example, very recent decisions by the Fourth Circuit uh, considering a constitutional challenge, a First Amendment challenge to a public school board that had publicly expressed its opposition to pending voucher legislation. Another very recent example, a sharply divided Sixth Circuit rejected a First Amendment challenge to a town's expenditure of public funds to express its views on ballot measures related to the town's fi fire department, its financing organization. So the debates are of long standing, but they continue today. Now, to review the objections, the concerns about government's campaign speech, first, some see the government's persuasive voice as inherently coercive given the government's role as sovereign. In other words, under this view, the sovereign speech will inevitably manipulate and thus undermine listeners' decision making. And that has totalitarian style implications for voters' free will. But in response, uh, just as not all exercises of power are equally troubling, government's persuasive expression by itself is not inevitably manipulative. Uh, and in a terrific article that uh, Professor Green wrote a few years ago, he addressed this more generally with respect to government speech. He wasn't specifically addressing campaign speech, but I think the analysis is the same. As he so powerfully explained, there is a meaningful distinction between persuasion and coercion. Coercion involves a type of pressure, a compulsion, a threat of certain adverse conduct. We've talked a little bit about this. If you go to jail, if the government doesn't like your views, if you, if you get fined, if the government doesn't like your views, if you lose your public job, because the government doesn't like your views. That's, that's a form of compulsion, a form of coercion. And we can certainly imagine some context in which government speech is coercive. For example, if it was delivered to a captive audience without any possibility for counter speech. But that does not describe debates over ballot measures or legislative proposals. No captive audiences, plenty of opportunity for counter speech. Persuasion, in contrast, can be pure speech as opposed to coercion. So we should be, take care to distinguish coercion from persuasion. Second, even if the government's campaign speech falls short of coercion, so even if voters are free to decide whether or not they agree with the government, some will agree with the government. Some will be persuaded. And as a result, some critics argue that the government's speech could change political outcomes in a way that's unfair to dissenters. And in response, not only do I think that critics overestimate the dangers of the influential dangers of government's campaign speech, but I think they also fail to appreciate that government speech on these issues can be enormously valuable in, in informing the, the public's own ability to govern itself. Certainly government expression is instrumentally valuable because it gives information that allows listeners to evaluate their government. So this, regardless, this is true whether or not the government is right or wrong. Uh, popular or unpopular. The fact that it is speaking means that it's ex exposing its policies, ex exposing its preferences to the public. It gives the public more with which to judge the government. And not only does transparently governmental campaign speech thus enhance public accountability, uh, so it's especially valuable for, for what uh, uh, experts call comparatively sophisticated voters, voters who sit down and learn about uh, an issue and evaluate the competing arguments. The government's voice adds an additional set of arguments to the marketplace of ideas, and it also exposes the government's policies and preference. But it also turns out that transparently governmental campaign speech can be a valuable heuristic or cognitive shortcut for comparatively uninformed voters, which is a significant number of voters who rationally decide that they don't have the time or the energy to do the research for themselves. And what many voters do is they rely on third parties, trusted or distrusted third parties. The opinions of those folks who took the time to analyze a particular issue, I know how I feel about that person's views, I may agree with them or I may disagree with them, but I'm going to use their views as a cue for my own views. And in fact, a significant body of evidence suggests that reliance on those sorts of heuristics enable comparatively uninformed voters to vote just as competently, meaning to vote in a way that actually maximizes their own policy preferences as comparatively well-informed voters. That, that, that sort of so using of the speaker's source the source of views as a heuristic is actually pretty effective. And among the most effective of those heuristics is the reliance on trusted or distrusted third parties, community leaders, experts, and government speakers. So denying voters access to the government's transparently sourced views, which would be the result of concluding that the government can't engage in campaign speech, would deny these voters a potentially valuable heuristic. Finally, government's voice on contested policy issues 
can be especially important in countering powerful and well-financed private speech that can operate in non-transparent ways. And this may be especially important in light of the Supreme Court's unwillingness in the Citizens United decision to permit regulation of the campaign speech of private parties. And if we focus specifically on ballot measures, uh, this helps illustrate the point. Ballot measures are often the subject of campaign speech by powerful and well-financed private parties. And the identity of those pri private parties often is unclear. Uh, interest groups involved in those campaigns not infrequently obscure their identity for strategic reasons. Here are just a couple of examples. Uh, a group called Californians for pay pay Paycheck Protection, hard to figure out who or what that really is, turned out to describe uh, a group of religious conservatives who were supporting limitations on labor union political activity. Similarly, Californians for Affordable and Reliable Electric Service turned out to describe a, a group of industry opponents of utility regulation. Hard for voters to use those names as a heuristic. They know how they feel about the governor, one way or the other. So for this reason, government's voice on ballot issues can be especially important in responding to private power that can sometimes operate in non-transparent ways. Now, to be sure, I don't mean to say that government always opposes powerful private interests. Often, often in, it's aligned with them. But I think there is constitutional value in preserving the possibility that government can add to the discourse. What the listener ideally needs is an understanding of the speaker's self-interest in evaluating the speech. And if anything, that's more likely with respect to government as opposed to private speech in these contexts, that voters can assess the government speaker's self-interest and hold him or her politically accountable for it. Now, wrapping up, while I've argued that government's campaign speech is as valuable as and no more dangerous than that of other speakers, and thus that government should not be understood to violate the Constitution when it engages in this sort of campaign speech. I, I want to close by noting that I'm not claiming that government is free from all legal constraints in this regard. So first, I want to emphasize that my constitutional conclusion is limited only to transparently governmental campaign speech, no sneaky governmental campaign speech. In order for it to be valuable, it has to be clear that it's coming from the government. Second, too, I want to emphasize that I've expressly defined campaign speech for these purposes as speech that advocates a position on a contested measure to be decided by the voters themselves or by a legislative body. And I agree that government's use of public funds or facilities to endorse or oppose specific candidates raises different and, in my mind, greater constitutional concerns. And then finally, I'm not claiming that the government has a First Amendment right to engage in this speech. I'm saying it has, it has a power. It doesn't violate the First Amendment when it engages this speech, but I'm not saying it's a First Amendment rights holder. The fact that the government is not a First Amendment rights holder may, leaves open the possibility that legislatures could constrain the government's speech through statute. For example, a legislature could prohibit entirely or maybe cap expenditures by a government speaker for or against a ballot measure. And in fact, a number of states do just that. I, I agree that that's constitutionally permitted. I would suggest that that may or may not be wise public policy, depending on the particular government speaker, because, as I've argued, I think that this speech actually is of enormous value to voters. Thanks for your time and your patience. Thanks, Helen. We've had a long day. I would say I'll try to be brief, but that would be a lie, so I'm not going to do that. But hopefully I'll be interesting. Um, my talk is not about the panel topic, but I, I have sketched out an answer to the panel topic. Here it is. The, the panel topic is, can government compel speech by designating it as its own? I think the answer is yes and no. <laughs> uh, yes, Zouderer is the case you want. If we're talking about a health or science claim, <laughs> The government, can, I think it's perfectly constitutional for the FDA to require food manufacturers to put the nutrition facts that we all love on product. That is government <coughs> compelled speech by designating it as its own. And cigarette warning labels, I believe, is an example of yes, government can compel, compel speech by designating it as its own. Uh, with regard to no, that would be Woolley versus Maynard, uh, the license, live for your die license plate, which everyone in New Hampshire is required to have. Um, I would say, uh, I would define the category in this way, any contested moral or policy uh, issue the government may not uh, compel people to say or carry by designating it as its own. Our current examples would be, I forget, it's, I think it's South, some of you may know, South Dakota, Nebraska case where the uh, state required doctors to tell pregnant women that they're, who are considering abortions that their fetuses are separate human beings. Uh, the, that's been upheld, I'm behind on this stuff. I think that's wrong, that's unconstitutional, that is, um, and also if the government were to adopt a pro-life or pro-choice 
license plate as its own state license plate and give you no alternative, that would violate Willie. So the answer to the question is yes and no, depending on whether we're talking about Zouderer or Willie. Now, my paper, um, which is on government speech and other things, although it is not on the paper on the panel topic, is called Speech Platforms. Uh, the state plays different roles, and free speech doctrine should and sometimes does respect those roles. We properly insist, with some categorical exceptions, that the state not regulate private speech based on subject matter or point of view. If private speakers want to praise the Nazis or condemn homosexuality, the state has no place stopping them, even if firmly convinced these ideas are wrong. Why we have such firm protection for speech we abhor is a matter of much debate. To some extent, it's because we don't trust the state to make content-based judgments consistently as a matter of principle. We fear that too often it will be merely playing favorites, helping friends, and harming enemies. One thing we know is that the state holds a monopoly over legitimate coercive force, and that when it jails or fines, it possesses the ability to squelch speech and not merely channel it to another outlet. We have similarly strict rules against the states drawing content-based lines in public places where people have traditionally gathered. We may build streets primarily for ease of movement and parks primarily for recreation, but citizens also use both to meet and discuss matters of the day, face ideas with which they may not be familiar and sometimes find quite odd. We can always walk by or away from such speech, so we are never captive in these settings. Even if streets and parks are technically owned by the state and not by private capital, they are held as a kind of public trust. We have made a collective decision, perhaps in part to ensure that not only the wealthy can ensure adequate avenues for their ideas, to reserve some property as space where speech may not be regulated based on content. On the other end of the spectrum, the state sometimes speaks itself. Some examples of this are obvious, and it is just as obvious that free speech doctrine is out of place here. So when the president advances his agenda or critiques his opponents, he may make whatever content-based judgments he likes. Similarly, when the FDA announces warnings regarding a food or drug, it can say what it believes to be true without giving equal time for the opposing point of view. The state, through these actors, may be advancing content-based contested positions in even points of view, but we know there are ample opportunities and other fora for disagreement to be stated. Neither a regulatory monopoly nor state control over property held in trust for public gathering is involved here. But the state speaks for itself in more disguised ways, and we generally are fine with it making content-based judgments there as well. Often this involves conditional funding, and the conditions often turn on speech content. If the state wants to promote childbirth and possible adoption over abortion, it may do so, whether it is speaking directly, say an official's speech to a group, or indirectly, say through funding a clinic that agrees to follow these rules. Perhaps we should require that the state's role in such selective funding be transparent at every level, most importantly, in this example, to the women receiving the health services. But such selective funding neither coerces private choice nor dominates the market for the relevant speech. I'm assuming in this example that abortion-related information is otherwise available to the women who seek clinic help. In addition to improving accountability, the transparency concern helps ensure that women seeking clinic help appreciate that they may not, may not be getting standard purely professional medical advice, but rather are getting the state's version. This will make it easier for them to appreciate there may be other sources to which they must turn for other points of view. Or consider if the state wants to fund the arts. It might not want to hold a lottery, but rather fund art it considers worthy of being backed by taxpayer money. This sort of judgment will inevitably involve attention to content. Perhaps the taxpayers want to fund only paintings of dogs or sunsets. Or perhaps they don't want to fund art they find disgusting. Determining what counts as disgusting will involve attention to content. But we're talking about taxpayer dollars only. Painters will still be able to produce, display, and sell disgusting art. In these ways, we permit a great deal of content-based selectivity when the state acts via direct speech or conditional spending rather than through regulating. And the selectivity may be based on subject matter or on viewpoint. The former is clear. The latter is harder, but is also clear. 
When we permit state conditional funding for we encourage you to carry your child to term, but refuse such funding for here are abortion alternatives, we are permitting a viewpoint distinction. When we permit a government agency to award arts grants only to work that is not indecent, we are permitting a set of case-by-case -case viewpoint distinctions. Now, indecency as a category isn't obviously viewpoint-based because it is in large part about taste and what seems disgusting or revolting. This kind of aesthetic judgment is hard to cubbyhole in our free speech doctrine. But if the underlying purpose of the limitation is to refuse taxpayer dollars for art that challenges mainstream sensibility via certain types of sexual images or images related to bodily functions, that desire to preserve mainstream values is similar to what happens when we fund a preferred viewpoint on a contested issue over another. That we permit content-based selectivity when the state acts as funder has nothing to do with the limited amount of funds available. We could insist on a lottery. We permit it because we want the state acting in our name to endorse some speech as good and refuse to give its endorsement to other speech. We don't live in the type of liberal democracy that would be strictly neutral, if such a thing were possible, as to the good. Because we insist on strict rules for regulation of private speech and for certain types of state-owned property, streets and parks, we can preserve a robust freewheeling speech marketplace in many arenas. The state, as speaker, and sponsor or patron of speech can act as the collective voice of the citizens. We get the best of both worlds, the world of public debate unfettered by the state, the world of state-sponsored speech that pushes some and not other views of the good. <clears throat> that the state may be selectively advancing a contested view of the good does not entail that it is adopting the speech as its own, nor that it is correct to attribute the speech to the state. Artists who receive NEA grants are not necessarily advancing the view of the US government. All we know is they are speaking within the range of acceptable taxpayer-funded ideas. And what about privately donated monuments to a municipality that, uh, that a municipality chooses to erect in a city park? It's one thing to say when a private homeowner erects a monument on her lawn, she expects viewers to attribute the speech to her, and they are likely to do so. This isn't true for monuments on city-owned property, I should say, isn't necessarily true. It all depends on local understandings, perhaps developed over time. Maybe the town park used to be a graveyard for a rich family, and their old tombstones are still up. Maybe the town park has a history of rotating monuments placed via lottery. Maybe it has a limited number of monuments, which have gone up in fits and starts over the years. But even in the latter case, it seems unlikely that the average passerby, with or without knowledge of local history, will attribute the content of the monument or its private sponsor to the city. Here's a better way to look at it. The city wants to provide a platform for some ideas and not others. It's not regulating, and it's not setting rules for transient speech in the park. It wants to be able to erect a Rotary Club monument and not erect a Nazi skinhead club monument. We should treat this no differently from how we treat the state's funding the National Endowment for Democracy, but refusing to fund a National Endowment for Totalitarian Dictatorship. Although the endowment example may be properly one of government speech, whereas the club example with the monuments is better termed one of providing a platform for private speech. When we let the state make content-based judgments in these settings, even viewpoint-based judgments, the state isn't necessarily endorsing the speech it allows or condemning the speech it excludes. Rather, acting as sponsor or patron of private speech, it is selectively shaping the content of what may be transmitted from state-provided speech platforms. Some of the messages will seem bland and pablum-like, who could disagree with a monument to the longtime coach of the multi-championship high school football team, but sometimes not. Say, a monument to a certain war, in a town with many pacifists who opposed war generally, and many non-pacifists who opposed this specific war. Again, the state isn't preventing opposing viewpoints from being aired. If the state opens a new park, it has to play by the rules of parks generally, i.e. no content-based speech regulation. Uh, I have to add here with regard to transient speech. Um, analogs to parks should be treated similarly. 
Although it's a bit of a harder question, if the state opens a municipal auditorium with an all-comers <coughs> policy, the all-comers may and must include groups many of us find odious, so long as they play by content-neutral time, place, and manner rules. But this gets significantly harder if we alter a few facts. What if the state is acting as a public university and administering student activities fees for student publications? Should we permit the state no content-based leeway here? For example, if the Establishment Clause is properly read to permit state funding for student religious speech, so long as funds go to secular speech as well, then there is no good reason to forbid funds for such publication, the religious ones. But does that mean the government, the university, public university, must authorize funds for the We Hate Black People magazine? Why? Because we think that idea may be a good one and needs its space in the marketplace of ideas? Because we are afraid if we permit the school to draw this line, all hell will break loose? Once we are past the basic contours of streets and parks, and I would say this next four sentences or so, five sentences is the core of my argument. Um, once we are past the basic contours of streets and parks, we should permit the state to make content-based restrictions when it makes available speech platforms via space or funding if there are good reasons to do so. This is very unrule-like, you may notice. <laughs> now, you might say, isn't a core concern of free speech doctrine that the state can't make reasoned judgments regarding speech content, whether acting in its initial policymaking role or its judicial review role? And I would say, in part, that's true. And that's why we cordon off regulation of private speech and some public property in this way. But otherwise, we want the state to make judgments of what's good and bad. Sometimes the state will be speaking when so doing. Other times it will be providing, or not, a platform for private speech. There are many justifiable reasons for the state to open speech platforms but place content-based limits. Platforms in question here may be many. The public college student publications I mentioned above, ads on public buses and subways, vanity license plates where the individual selects as opposed to the state motto cases, uh, adopt to highway signs, and others. So for example, perhaps the state wants to permit advertising for various products and services in its subways and buses, but avoid potential controversy from permitting candidate advertising for political office. By the way, I've written this whole paper and I'm going to publish it without footnotes. So in part, it's a little game for First Amendment students to play and figure out all the cases I'm talking about. Um, at the end, I provide a list of them. Um, uh, true political speech, an article without footnotes, true political speech generally is more highly valued than other speech. But here we'd be permitting all the uh, private political speech and streets, parks political speech that the candidates can muster. What we'd be saying is that it's a legitimate concern, not an overwhelming one, but a legitimate concern, that the average bus rider might mistakenly think the state is endorsing a candidate whose sign is up when another's isn't, or that it's a legitimate concern that better funded candidates will find a kind of captive audience, especially among those citizens who, for various reasons, have to take public transportation. How about a state-run candidates forum, limited to candidates who are currently polling above a certain percent? If the justification is that debates work better without a zillion candidates on stage and isn't simply a clever way for those in power to favor their friends, then we should permit the limitation. The state should also have the power to refuse to open platforms to speech that offends core, commonly held values based in our commitment to equal protection of the laws. Examples here could include no vanity license plates that disparage persons on the basis of race and other protected characteristics. No funding for student groups that do the same. Refusal to allow the KKK to adopt a section of the highway and say so on the highway sign. Although the state has an interest in avoiding having speech misattributed to it, the concern is not or not primarily about misattribution. In most of these situations, especially if the state uh, has treated the platform as open to all comers, most people would understand that the state is not endorsing any particular message. Rather, the state's primary concern in any of these settings, I, I claim, is to set up speech platforms without providing the opportunity for some persons or groups to cause message-based harm to other persons or groups based on race, ethnicity, national origin, religion, gender, sexual orientation, or other characteristics on the basis of which we think it proper to offer people protection. That there are good reasons to provide platforms for hate speech, 
whether the speech itself reads as hateful or whether the group itself is understood as adopting principles of hate or disparagement is indisputable. Core free speech doctrine nonetheless protects hate speech in part to ensure an open marketplace for the exchange of ideas. This may provide a peaceful outlet for odious ideas and may allow those ideas to be proven false. There are also arguments based in democratic theory or individual autonomy. But we can protect those underlying free speech values by permitting hateful, disparaging speech by private actors on their own turf <coughs> and nickel, and by offering them as well the turf of streets and parks as common meeting grounds. Having done so, we can cordon off other state-provided speech platforms from such speech as an extension of the idea that the government may be content selective in its own speech. The state's rejudgment to refuse platform to speech it deems offensive to core values of equality requires it to draw some tricky lines based on the viewpoint of the message or the group. For example, the state might prevent a subway ad that says Jews are horrible people, but permit one that preaches tolerance for all religions. These are clearly viewpoint-based judgments that we refuse the state when regulating private speech or when administering streets and parks. In part, we do so because we don't want the state skewing the discourse, in part because we don't think the state can draw clear lines here or can draw them without playing favorites in a way that serves no valid public purpose. My proposal is that we should run these risks for state-created speech platforms in a way we refuse to run them when the state regulates private speech or administers streets and parks. The values the state is protecting <coughs> are significant ones and ought to have an arena of private speech in which they prevail. The same argument should hold for sexual or vulgar speech. Here the viewpoint discrimination concern is less because it's less clear that refusing to permit a fuck you vanity license plate or a porn club at the local high school is a viewpoint based judgment. But whether it is or not, sexual or vulgar speech, although protected in the private and streets parks arenas, is sufficiently offensive to most people that the state should be allowed to protect such sensibilities by not offering new speech opportunities for the offense. I am not suggesting, though, that we should permit the state to make viewpoint-based distinctions of any sort whatsoever when it sets up speech platforms. In particular, it may not open a platform for one side only in a currently contested matter. Again, a difficult rule, but that's the one I'm proposing. This is so even if it may use its own speech to promote one side over another. So although it may promote childbirth over abortion, it may not permit a right-to-life vanity license plate while refusing the pro-choice plate. Although it may spend money promoting climate change legislation, it may not permit the student environmental club to meet after hours while refusing to permit a club to meet that denies human agency and increased carbon emissions, and so on. Here is where the distinction between government speech and state-provided speech platforms matters. If the state is willing to claim speech as its own, then it may participate in debate without giving equal time to the other side. But if it is merely setting up platforms for private speech, then it forfeits the government speech mantle and its reasons for making viewpoint distinctions change. To provide a speech platform for one side but not the other in a current debate should be seen as improper skewing of the speech marketplace. To provide a speech platform for the religion's tolerance group but not the group that hates a specific sect also skews debate, but we should deem protection against disparagement a trumping value, at least in the setting of state-provided speech platforms. The state should, though, be permitted to exclude all sides of a currently contested controversy, i.e. to make subject matter rather than viewpoint distinctions in these settings. So although it may not permit only one or the other vanity <coughs> license plate in the abortion controversy, it may refuse to authorize vanity plates on the entire issue. The legitimate state interest isn't avoiding improper attribution of one message or another to the state, and it's not avoiding providing a platform for hateful or vulgar messages. Rather, it's the somewhat weaker state interest in shunting debate on controversial issues to the private or streets parks arenas and keeping other state-provided speech platforms for more mainstream uncontested matters. There's a close analogy to the state's power as sponsor or patron of private speech to track mainstream taxpayer sensibility, avoiding controversy. Now, the court's set of opinions on religious speech in schools, 
when the state has opened space for speech and then refused it for religious speech are consistent with my approach. To some extent, the state actors in question just had a misguided view of the Establishment Clause. They thought that if a school permits a religious study or worship group into a space otherwise open for speech, then the state might be unconstitutionally advancing or endorsing religion. But it wouldn't be, for it would be correct to see the state not as promoting the religious views in question, but rather as providing a platform for religious speech on equal terms with other speech. And there's no good reason not to provide such a platform. Religious speech as such is a core part of the US fabric, and the state has no legitimate argument against it based on content. It would be a mistake, however, to read this line of cases as extending to a broader content neutral rule for how the state must manage platforms it creates for private speech. The doctrine says the state may make reasonable content based distinctions here. That fits my argument. The doctrine also says the state may not make viewpoint decisions here. That doesn't fit my argument. But apart from the religion setting, I do not believe there are any court holdings as opposed to dicta to the contrary of my position, permitting some viewpoint-based distinctions in state-created speech platforms, again treating separately streets and parks. True, in most of the religious speech cases, the court viewed the restriction on such speech in the public school college setting as a viewpoint-based restriction and thus invalid. But the better argument is that the restrictions on religious speech, better put, the refusal to provide a platform for religious speech, had no good justification. That they were viewpoint-based was a red herring, not the real reason they were invalid. Or put another way, they were illegitimately viewpoint-based, leaving open the possibility of legitimate viewpoint-based distinctions in this setting. This line of cases doesn't hold that once a school opens after-school classroom space, or a school auditorium, or school student activities money for some speech, it must open it for all speech on a viewpoint-neutral basis. That is, there is no holding that says the school has to permit the we hate black people or Nazi party group to have equal access. Let's do have a few minutes. One last issue, just another controversial issue I'm going to weigh in on. Let's turn finally to anti-discrimination norms in the setting of state-created speech platforms. The state may not itself disparage people based on race, and it may not sponsor speech that does so. A more limited version of this argument would suggest that at least the state may choose to not so disparage persons and may choose to not provide platforms for such disparagement. Thus, if a state law school chooses to provide meeting space and activities funds for student groups generally, but not for groups that espouse hatred of persons based on race, the law school is acting according to a legitimate public purpose. It shouldn't matter if the protected characteristic has been deemed to trigger strict or intermediate scrutiny. Those are rules for limiting judicial review of legislative action and not rules that should bind the policymaker itself. If there is a good reason, yes, we will have to judge it, for deeming a characteristic in need of state protection, then that is a good reason for the state to refuse a platform for disparaging speech on the basis of such a characteristic. Thus, this state law school may refuse a platform for anti-gay speech, even if sexual orientation has not yet been treated with elevated scrutiny by the court. I note again that private speech may not be regulated on this basis. <coughs> now what about regulation of associations based not on their speech, but on their exclusionary decisions based on certain characteristics, say sexual orientation? The state law school must permit a group, say a religious one that has a negative view about homosexuality, to exist, its members to associate even if that involves exclusion from membership and or leadership uh, to gays and lesbians. This rule is but an offshoot of our freedom of association rules generally. The state may not insist that such <coughs> groups change their internal practices. But if the state is providing speech and associational opportunities, say activities funds or announcements in the school's weekly newsletter or bulletin board space or a school email address or meeting space or use of the school's name and logo, I think I got all of them, from a recent case unnamed by me, it may choose to advance the view of the good justifiably, if not necessarily, that it believes to be true and refuse these platforms to groups that do not treat gays and lesbians equally. Is this viewpoint discrimination? That's a hard question. If the school refused to permit the group to speak its views regarding homosexuality, 
then that would be viewpoint discrimination and illegitimate as regulation of private speech. If it refused to sponsor such views as part of a general opening of space or funds, such views, <coughs> that is the speech, that would also be viewpoint discrimination, but justifiable, as I argued above. If it refuses to sponsor groups on the ground that such groups have exclusionary membership leadership rules based on sexual orientation, that might not properly be considered viewpoint discrimination because it's based on conduct and not speech. This would get us into the whole R.A.V. Mitchell dilemma of is are such distinctions based on content at all or viewpoint at all. I'll leave that aside. Um, but whether or not we properly deem the school's decision one based on viewpoint, it's defensible and constitutional because A, it doesn't regulate private speech or association, and B, it advances a legitimate, although contested, view of the good namely the equality of persons regardless of sexual orientation. Other public law schools might take a different view, permitting space and funds for groups, religious or otherwise, that don't support the equality of gays and lesbians. Unless we consider the equal protection argument to be of the strong version, per, uh, forbidding the state from sponsoring such groups, we should deem the matter optional for each school to make its own determination about the view of the good it wishes to advance. Now a conclusion. Here's what I've argued. The state acts in many different ways. Sometimes it seeks to create platforms for private speech. Acting in this capacity, the state is neither regulating private speech nor speaking itself, nor is it administering traditional places for people to gather, associate, and speak, such as streets and parks. The state has good reasons for refusing to provide speech platforms for hateful or vulgar speech. This is not about the fear of improper attribution of such messages to the state. Rather, the state's interests are protecting persons from the sting of hateful speech based on characteristics we consider morally and politically irrelevant, such as race, and to a lesser extent in protecting persons from the sting of vulgar or sexually indecent speech. These are values we forbid the state from advancing via regulation of private speech. But just as the state may advance these values through its own speech, so may it advance them via selective exclusion from state-created speech platforms. The risk of favoritism and unprincipled line drawing, a key reason to insist on strong free speech protection when the state is regulating or administering streets and parks, should take a backseat to the protection of core commonly held values when the state is setting up and administering new opportunities for private speech. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, first, I want to give Professor Norton or, uh, and Professor Green an opportunity to respond to each other's talk. Good. We're good? Okay. All right. Uh, I, I'll exercise my prerogative as moderator, too. Uh, just very quickly on Professor Norton's, I would say that there's two other arguments in favor of actually why government speech is a good thing. <coughs> I mean, one, of course, is just uh, perhaps a way to rearticulate what you argued is that there's a collective action problem that often can, can occur in the political and electoral process where you do have well-financed, uh, concentrated groups uh, that are able to fund their campaigns. Where, it, and to, to say that government can't get involved is to uh, completely ignore the fact that government is a direct response to those problems, right? It is the prototypical collective action mm -hmm. response, or we are acting collectively to deal with that. Uh, and then, of course, that, that, that the government speech is less intrusive than direct regulation, mm -hmm. right? So if, if we could, uh, aside from the constitutional questions about uh, often ballot issues or property taxes, if the government could regulate it directly, isn't it better in some respects to allow the government to speak about it rather than uh, to, to actually engage in regulation? Mm -hmm. um, uh, Professor Green, I've loved your talk because I saw it earlier, and I what? But I've been confused because it seemed like the value of it uh, was the concern to go back to Professor Shower's idea of rules. Right? I mean, the problem is in you know, our public forum doctrine versus government speech doctrine. It's the in between, right? It's the limited public fora cases give us such headaches, right? And the pushback is often, you know, we want to use it and treat it as a public forum because the speech would otherwise be consistent under those circumstances with uh, the nature of the use. But it seemed like your argument was essentially collapsing it, right? eliminating the limited public forum doctrine. Notice, yes. notice I did this without using that term at all. Yes, well, and, and it's a good thing because the terms have so much weight behind them and, and all sorts of uh, confusion as well. Uh, but then there's, you kind of pull it back right at the end. Right, so I was kind of with you on, in the sense that I, uh, the government can speak and say all of these things about whether or not it, it wants to promote uh, a certain group or not or a certain policy or not in society. But then when it opens up a platform to allow private groups to come in and speak, 
Uh, and it's not adopting it as, as its own, right? I mean, that, that, that's why I take as your point. I, I, I would be fine with the conclusion that we're just adopting it as our own speech, and we could have a broader definition of what speech is acceptable, uh, including that there's room for debate and even a quality of how to engage in that debate because it's still the government speech. Confused as to the kind of intellectual or the theoretical distinction between that and then saying, well, it's not the government speech, but we can open it for very limited purposes. Um, well, obviously, this is a uh, uh, this piece is a um, uh, is you know is controversial. I mean, a lot of people aren't going to like it, and for different reasons. Fred Shower may not like it because doesn't have enough rules. Bye, Fred. Other others of you might may not like it for different reasons, but it clearly is meant to, without using the phrase, challenge the reigning orthodoxy about what are supposed to be permitted and limited public forums. And you know, the, the phrasing has changed over the years, um, but I think at least in um, the Hastings case, uh, they all use the phrase limited public forum without seeming to note that it was, is a term that's been, and they all seem to mean opening, what I call opening a speech platform, and then what sort of limitations can you place on it. And the dicta has always been, dicta except in the religion cases, um, that content-based distinctions are okay if they're reasonable, but not viewpoint-based distinctions. Um, and the, I would say the main main new thing I'm trying to do in this piece is to say that, that viewpoint-based distinctions should be permissible in these settings subject to all of the arguments that I make, which are arguments about, as is pretty much I do in all my scholarship, argues about substance, arguments about norms and values. I don't really believe that there are many neutral planes we can return to. Um, so I, I'm trying to push the argument on that, and, and the only doctrinal hook I have in my favor is that, as I say, other than the Widmore line of cases, which could be, I think, understood separately. There are no holdings on the viewpoint issue, I don't think, in, these, in this type of setting other than dicta. I would agree wholeheartedly. When I teach it, I always point out it's only the religion speech cases that win in the limited public forum cases. Otherwise, on pretty much any other speech is, is, is permissibly excluded. But although these, you know, most of these cases are still kicking around the lower courts, these cases right. that... Um, I mean, Lehman would be the only one, maybe, that's been decided, and that's obviously quite controversial, though I offered some support for it to here today. Um, I actually have a question for Helen, as well, um, which is about transparency. You say Garcetti undermines public interest in transparent <coughs> government speech. Um, and you say one of the things you're working on is whether government speech is limited, uh, whether deceptive government speech is, might be limited. So I just want to know, do you think there is, or what's your current position on whether there's a First Amendment right for citizens to have, like, open, to know what its government is up to truthfully? I, I think that's actually two questions. Um, the, the first one, uh, uh, so th these are really tentative. Um, so let's have let's do this again next year, and then I'll tell you what I what I think. Um, I don't know that there's a First Amendment right. Mm, I'm less comfortable saying there's a First Amendment right to know everything that the government is doing. I think there could be statutory rights, and that's what the Freedom of Information Act. Are. There's lots of statutory pressures, and we should have more statutory pressures, more um, uh, mechanisms that force government to tell us what to do. But I don't know that the Constitution always compels that. Um, the second question is the harder one, the one that I'm wrestling with. If the government decides to speak, must it do so truthfully? Mm. Does the Constitution require it to do so truthfully? Um, and my preliminary answer is yes, um, but you know, can I point to any precedent? No, but I, I, I'm working on it. Mm. It's, a great, it's a great issue. Thank you. Uh, and I, I guess uh, this one is to Professor Norton. Uh, I'm, I'm familiar with the Garcetti case, but I haven't looked at all the cases after Garcetti. But when you were talking about them, uh, you mentioned a number of instances in, in Garcetti itself to some extent, but I, I think an argument could be made not to the full extent of some of the other cases you discussed, where what the individual employees were speaking out about were things that under a lot of state statutes might fit the whistleblower protection. And so I was wondering in those cases uh, if there was a clash in any of the cases that you know between a whistleblower protection and then this view of essentially the government employer's right to control speech and, and how that worked itself out. 
Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so there's a theoretical clash, but not a practical one, meaning um, the majority, and it was, a, it was a sharply divided court, a five to four court, in saying there's no First Amendment protection, no constitutional protection for this whistleblower. The First Amendment does not protect whistleblowing speech if it's pursuant to the employee's official job duties. So one exception, if our prosecutor, instead of writing an internal memorandum saying, I don't think we should go forward with this search warrant because I think the police uh, are making misrepresentations, if instead he had written a letter to the editor saying our police is corrupt, even under Garcetti, we could go forward with that claim. We'd, we'd still decide whether there's a winning, but we could go forward with it. Uh, but Garcetti makes clear that because he did what his job required him to do, which is to make judgments about police work, that that was the government's job, uh, the government's speech, uh, and they could control it completely. They said, so. Don't, but then they went on to say, look, um, this is not so bad because statutes could protect whistleblowing. The Constitution doesn't protect this form of whistleblowing, but statutes could. Well, that's true, statutes could. But most often, they don't. There's, it's a patchwork of state statutes. Um, and in the cases, I, and I, have, I have dozens of cases cited in the article that's in your material, uh, and you know, dozens of cases that are thrown out after Garcetti, where police officers and others are truthfully reporting improprieties. There was no applicable statutory whistleblower protection. So unless and until the legislature has the political will to pass the statute, the Constitution is the only fallback, and it's now unavailable after Garcetti. I have a question for Professor Green. I really loved your theory. I loved um, the article, Government of the Good, a while back. And I think it's interesting to, um, I think it's correct that uh, it was the religion cases that erased the distinction between content and viewpoint. And I can see the idea of trying to table them and saying that that's from the Supreme Court. A lot of, a lot of lower courts, of course, have kind of erased that line as well, applying the religion cases to non-religion um, problems, but in the court, I think that's correct. But I'm curious about your your way of distinguishing them. So you say that they weren't really decided based on viewpoint, and, and didn't really allow the um, excuse me, didn't really allow viewpoint discrimination, uh, discrimination. That really it was a case that they didn't have a good justification for making those distinctions. And I think that's probably true in Rosenberger and Lance Chapel. When it comes to good news, though, I wonder if you can really make that argument. Because, of course, you know, it was a, a mostly Christian school. It's a Christian revival meeting, practically, a, a religious class that's going on immediately after school in the lower grades. It seems to me that there'd be a lot of good justifications for not allowing that, especially in a case when you wouldn't expect there to be an alternative viewpoint coming up. So do you think it's part of your argument? Do you think it's necessary to your argument to distinguish those cases? And if so, what do you think of my problems with good news? So um, uh, <coughs> in that set of cases, one type of problem which could come up, which I have not addressed today at all, is involvement of the school, which could raise establishment clause problems. So put that aside. I'm not addressing those issues at all. Um, another issue could involve unequal access. I'm not addressing those issues at all. I mean, unequal access if you only, you know, if you don't let the minority group. Right. Um, but uh, I actually think that um, I have been persuaded over time that I'm um, assuming we agree with the Establishment Clause holding, which, again, I'm not talking about today. The core, in all these cases, basically, there's an Establishment Clause aspect to it, which is, um, and the court has said consistently, as long as this, these school rooms or funds are open equally, there's no endorsement, there's no favoritism, it's just, right? And so if that's true in these cases, um, then I think that there is, in fact, no good reason for not letting the religious group meet, assuming there's no school involvement. And that's what I mean by um, if the school were to exclude them, it might be, it might or might, it might be viewpoint based, but, but the reason it's problematic isn't simply that it's viewpoint based, it's that it's viewpoint based without a good reason. Whereas I suggest there are other type of, there's no good reason once we kick out the establishment clause concern, I think, to, to not let these groups meet. So that, that's sort of my answer to that. Here. I'm going to address this to Professor Green. <clears throat> I was telling several of my faculty colleagues that about every two years or so <clears throat> in my basic tax course, I do the Bob Jones University case. And I've always found the Bob Jones University case very troubling. And I've never been able to understand why the lawyers in Bob Jones didn't raise a First Amendment issue instead of letting, letting the entire argument turn on the meaning of the word charitable. Uh, that was tortured out of all proportions. 
where exactly would you would you would you support the result from Bob Jones today, or would you say that um, if, if a First Amendment issue had been raised, that they could always speak on their own nickel? Although I might I might add that if you if you disallow an exemption for Bob Jones, um, that that in effect means that donors cannot make charitable contributions, deductible charitable contributions, and that has severely impacted that school happily. And so just remind the um, the t I'm out of tax, so this was an exemptions case? Yeah. Just, re yeah, just they, remind they, me the tax uh, the court fact said that about the, it. The Internal Revenue Service could deny an exemption to Bob Jones because uh, yeah, it okay. espoused what was basically uh, a view contrary and to that, and that means that, policy. That means I can't make the deduction to it as a charitable organization. That's and right. does it and does it affect their coffers in other ways as well as a tax matter? Uh, other than the individual no but I think that loss of the loss of the ability to attract charitable donors yeah no I just wanted to know that yeah I mean I, I I haven't read it in a while but I think it's correctly decided I mean I think that I don't know if I would write the I haven't read it in a while so I don't know if I'd write the opinion the same way but I think the government can refuse to provide funding for groups that discriminate on bases that it considers invidious that's how I would answer it And, and I would view that as a kind of funding. I would view the tax, any type, I, this is where I don't know tax law enough, but I view any of these sort of tax consequences as a type of funding, so. Yeah, you see, that's where I would have, to, I, that seems wrong to me, so, okay. <laughs> there was a First Amendment claim in Bob Jones, it was under the Free Exercise Clause, right. which is also in the First Amendment, and, and the court blew it away in a couple of sentences on compelling interest grounds. Um, the question I put in my hand to ask is for uh, Professor Norton. I've been naively telling my students for years that the Establishment Clause is a very special rule uh, that on secular political matters, of course government could try to lead public opinion. That's what governments do. And, and so it's a very special protection to say government can't take positions on religious questions. I had no idea about these cases you described uh, saying government can't try to get its bonds passed and so forth. And I'm wondering, um, in, in recent years, not going back to Justice Brennan on the New Jersey Supreme Court, but in, in recent years, is there a political valence for those cases? Are those cases coming from the right and are those claims being accepted by conservative judges or is this coming on both sides? And is it confined to referenda or do these judges believe the president can't try to rally support for the war effort mm -hmm. or the bailout or the TARP fund? Um, and do these same judges think it's just hunky-dory if the government wants to sponsor religion? So those are a terrific set of questions. Uh, I, I, too, was really surprised by these cases. I, I stumbled across them in writing another article, which is how a lot of articles um, come about. I stumbled across this Brennan opinion from 1953, which then gets cited for decades to come. And I was stunned by it. That Brennan, when he's on the New Jersey Supreme Court, says a school board can't can't tell voters to support schools. I, I, it's, I found it, it astonishing. I, I want to be clear that there are um, some trends, although they're not perfectly chronologically divided, that the more recent trend is to be deeply suspicious of these claims. The more recent trend is for courts to be com pretty comfortable with government's political advocacy. It is not, um, it's not an unmitigated trend. We, d we do see some outliers, even today. But over time, we do see the courts starting out with Brennan in the 50s, deeply suspicious of government's political advocacy period, where it's today, for the, for the most part, more courts are pretty comfortable with government's political advocacy. Um, and in, I have a couple of theories about that, but I b really invite other theories as well, because I've puzzled over this. I think in part, it's because in the last 20 years, we've seen this, this term government speech emerge for the first time as a matter of constitutional doctrine. Government has been speaking from the beginning, but we didn't give it this fancy name with significant constitutional implications until arguably 1991 or maybe thereafter. And maybe the fact of naming it um, has, has given more comfort with something that's been going on all along. Um, you know, the political valence I mean, is, uh, I think these judges, I don't know how they feel about religion. I haven't, I haven't sort of checked that at all. But, you know, these are judges on the left and judges on the right. And Brennan is on the left, and he changed his mind over time. Um, we still see these claims today, and I'm actually sort of suspecting that we're going to see more of them um, with the growth of the Tea Party, deeply suspicious of, of governmental roles in many respects. So why not deeply suspicious of government's participation in contested political debates, which is why I think it continues to be alive and important issue. <laughs>
Um, this question is pr for Professor Norton. Um, I noticed that a lot of the examples you were doing about with contested government uh, speech in elections dealt with a lot on the local level. I'm wondering how your theory applies when you're dealing with it more on the national level, specifically when you might be going against national speech versus, say, state speech. In specifics, I'm thinking of drug policy. It's the federal government's position for that marijuana is an illegal drug, but you're now seeing a lot of states engage in ballot initiatives to make it legal. Arizona recently passed one allowing it for medical purposes, and in California, it narrowly uh, failed for allowing it for recreational purposes. Do you think it is permissible for the federal government to get involved to weigh in on state ballot initiatives on these issues? Oh, you mean so like if, if President Obama or Attorney General Holder were to say to the voters of Arizona, y'all, sh you should vote against this, this is a bad idea? That's exactly what yeah. happened in California where yeah. both President Obama and Eric Holder said this should not pass because because this will uh, we will enforce our federal laws, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So for, that's a great question. Um, if we're just talking about the speech, the speech, I, I actually don't have a problem with it. Um, and, the, and you're reminding me of, a, of another example that this is this is a live issue on the federal front, meaning for years, um, certain members of Congress have been unhappy with executive branch advocacy on legislative matters. And this started in the 1950s when Eisenhower was trying to pass a health care proposal. Uh, and he and his, his, um, his executives, the, head, the then Secretary of HHS, the HHS precursor, were going around the country trying to drum up support for this administration bill. Members of Congress thought it was inappropriate for the executive branch to go to the public on a legislative matter. Passed in 1951 a, 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 an appropriations rider that prohibits executive branch officials from engaging in publicity or propaganda. Publicity or propaganda is and never has been defined, so it's largely unenforced, but it has remained on the books in the 60 years since then as an expression of congressional unhappiness with the executive branch going to the public on a legislative matter. Now, of course, the executive branch does this all the time, which is why it's largely unenforced, but it shows sort of the clash of values, that some folks think that government shouldn't be talking to folks about certain issues, um, that other government bodies are going to be decided. So you're raising also a federalism issue, right? Should, the, should an executive branch um, official go to um, state folks and, t and tell them how to vote? And I don't have any problem with that for all the reasons that I identified in my talk. I think that's another voice to add to the marketplace of ideas. Sometimes that executive branch official will have special expertise that's relevant on the law enforcement front. Sometimes that executive branch official will be a really valuable heuristic for an uninformed voter. I love Eric Holder. I hate Eric Holder, but, but depending on, so depending on how I feel about Eric Holder, that's going to help me figure out how to vote uh, on this initiative. Certainly we know more about Eric Holder and Barack Obama than we do about a lot of organiz private organizations that will be mobilizing around that issue that are not identified by specific individuals. I, again, this is sort of one of the situations where I think the more government speech, um, the better. And you can imagine any, uh, back in uh, California in the 1990s when California was considering an initiative that would end state affirmative action programs. Bill Clinton advocated against it, saying, you know, this is why I think affirmative action is value. You might valuable. You might love Bill Clinton. You might hate Bill Clinton. That was valuable information for you to have as a voter, well, how Bill Clinton felt about that issue. Just a quick follow-up question. So I want to push it a little bit more. So <coughs> assuming that, that there were some discretionary funds available in some agency, would it be constitutional in your view for the U.S. government to spend money running big, a big ad buy in California? It is the view of the U.S. HHS that you should not vote for re recreational marijuana. Would that be constitutional? Yes, I think that would be constitutional. Um, again, I don't think the government has a First Amendment right to do that, right. so you could, you could prohibit it as a matter of but statute. There'd be, there'd be yeah. no claim against it. Yeah. I have a quick question for each. Um, so, Abner, what if the reason offered in the Good News Club was that they were trying to avoid controversy, and so they wanted to preclude all religious groups, pro and con, from meeting? That's your question. And um, for Helen, is, is much of the persuasiveness of your argument dependent on the assumption that government speech is likely more likely to counteract powerful private speech than align with it? And if so, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you don't have any empirical evidence to support that claim. What would be the reasons why government speech is more likely to be counteracting private speech rather than aligning powerful private speech and exacerbating that problem? You go. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so, excuse me. Thank you for that question. Um, 
it's one of my several arguments. One of I have several theories for why government speech here is especially valuable. One, but certainly not the only one, is that it, it sometimes is a counter to powerful private interests. I don't pretend that that is always the case, or even most often the case. You're right, I have no empirical data. All I can tell you is the times when government gets sued for speaking is when it counters powerful private interests, which is why I want to preserve the opportunity for them to do so. <laughs> that was great. Um, <laughs> Uh, um, so, I mean, I, I basically need to work through this a little bit, but I, for me, the con so what are the factors that matter? Um, the, ty the context, the type of platform, which might otherwise be called forum, but I'm trying to not use that word. Um, because I think the word platform is uh, evidential of something. Um, and also, the, uh, there's an issue in all these cases about the scope of inclusion and the scope of exclusion that I think can be probative of what's going on. So, I mean, I don't love the Lehman holding. You know, that's the one where, where it's from here, right? No, it's from Ohio, right? <coughs> Shaker Heights. We have a spoils on the case. What's that? We have a spoils on the case. There you go. Um, I've never been to Shaker Heights. Maybe we could do like a little road trip. Um, uh, so in Lehman, they basically say, we want commercial ads only, right? And we're going to exclude other stuff. Um, I may not have the facts exactly right. And to me, that, so, so that's fine because it seems that, that it's pretty clear that they just want to raise revenue from, and that anything else, I, I don't know if it wasn't anything else, but in my ideal world, let's say it's anything else, anything else that might be at all beyond the sort of commercial realm would be excluded. So I can understand what they're really up to. So in the school setting, if the school opens its clubs for everything but religious groups of any sort, right? Well, Yes, yeah, school space. Right, 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 right. Meeting space. Right. If a school opens its meeting space for every type of group to do whatever they want to do, except religious groups or athe yeah, any group on the issue of religion, we're going to assume. Um, see that the problem is, it strikes me that the notion that we're just wanting to avoid controversy doesn't quite strike me correctly, because then you'd want to exclude all political discussion groups and policy. So you then just leave. Now, if a school says we just want to have the sports teams and the chess clubs and the mathletes and not have any political groups or religious groups. Then I might say it's stupid, but it's probably constitutional. I would say it's probably constitutional, I think. But just religion strikes me as. Okay. as controversial. Yeah, I, I, you know, I get. I, I think I would say that's stupid, but fine. <laughs> I think is what, is what I want to say. <laughs> I mean, it's a weak, that's a weak interest, right? Avoiding disparagement by race is a strong interest. Avoiding vulgar speech is a medium interest. Avoiding controversy is a weak interest that I'm working through a little bit, but I think it's probably okay if, if it's a broad enough exclusion. I have a question for Professor Green, specifically about your hate speech exclusion. Um, the definition of hate is fluid, and it changes with time. And if we, if we say that, you know, we've seen some examples of that here today even, uh, you know, if you, maybe if you soften it to persecution, um, if you have this hate speech exclusion, are you going to interfere with the marketplace of ideas over what is hate? Yeah, so, so this is the key objection. The, this gentleman is posing a version of the key objection. I think, I think of it as the key objection to my argument. Um, let me just give a little history on that. Sadly, he's left again. Fred Schauer was my professor at Michigan, um, taught me in a course called the Critical Legal Studies Movement, which was interesting if you know Fred and know the Critical Legal Studies Movement. Um, it was a great class, and I learned a lot from him. And, um, and he was helpful in initially going on the market and helping me prepare. He was just a great, fabulous mentor. And, and when I started teaching my free speech course, I started relying on, and still rely on, his great book from early in his career called Free Speech, A Philosophical Inquiry. This is getting back to your question. And what Fred does in that book, and I recommend it to all of you, is in his beautifully cogent, clear way, takes us through all the justifications for why we have a special free speech principle. Why do we treat speech specially even though it can harm, right? That's why it's an interesting issue. Um, and he goes through autonomy, democracy, truth, and sort of says there's something to all of these, but it's not complete. Ultimately, the key reason he, if I'm remembering correctly, that we have to treat speech specially is the concern that we can't draw lines properly. I think he calls it negative theory. We just don't trust the government in, this, in these sort of ideological areas to consistently draw lines properly. We have to set up a rule, and the rule is our free speech rule against content-based decision making. The core of my piece here, really, is to try to say that that makes sense and, and we need it in regulation of private speech and, and, although it is underdeveloped, in streets and parks. I mean, that's this streets and parks is this intermediate area. But I'm trying to push the idea that because there is also great harm from hate speech, and, 
even though it will have to be defined by each school who's administering their after school program or each city that's administering its buses or subways or its adopt to highway signs and local officials are going to have to make these judgments that I'm willing to say we should risk the case by case failure of those judgments, the ad hocery of those judgments and weigh more heavily the protecting of the vulnerable persons in this setting of speech platforms, whereas we will, would not allow that ad hocery in the broader set. I mean, it's that pr I'm trying to thread a needle a little bit here, and I recognize that this is the core problem, uh, uh, contention against my position. Um, but I just think sometimes we can, we can say, more concerned about ad hocery here, more concerned about protecting people from hate speech here, and sort of let it filter out that. <coughs> Um, it, it was said that, uh, let's see, it, 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 it was said that the, the, the government uh, has the, the, the right to, um, to, to limit certain, to, to, to promote certain speech but to, and, and to limit certain other speech. But, but wouldn't it be better if, it, if the government uh, promoted open forums so, th so that people of, uh, of all political hues and, and stripes may, may pre present their, their platform? If, if the government wants the, this uh, image of, of being um, non-totalitarian and, and valuing citizen participation. I actually, that's a great question, and I actually am all in favor of that. That is nothing in my, I don't want, I mean, I didn't talk about it here, but nothing in, I don't want anything in my paper to suggest that I'm not a big fan of government providing space and funds for a, everyone to speak. That is, I think that parks with band shells and auditory and spaces and Hyde Park corners sponsored by the government without limitation on content are fabulous things. And I think that government providing, I in fact think, you know, um, there, there's a line of free speech scholarship, although not Supreme Court doctrine, that suggests the government sort of has an obligation to more positively uh, provide seed money and space for a thousand flowers to bloom, even if we hate them. So I'm, I'm actually all in favor of that. I'm thinking of Owen Fiss and Cass Sunstein a little bit in their work. So I would favor a robust streets parks forum provided by the government and then other specific Platform. We'd have to figure out exactly what they were, where the government can say, here we want to tailor it some more in a certain way. And exactly how I draw that line, I'm a little less clear about, but I'm in favor of robust in both areas. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, I, yeah my, whole, my whole premise is based on the notion that government is not shutting down other vehicles for campaign speech. That would be uh, completely repugnant to the First Amendment. My, my argument is that to the extent that people are talking about campaign issues, they're talking about ballot measures, they're, they're talking about legislative proposals, that there should, no be constant, there should be no constitutional exclusion of the government from that discussion. Um, that leads into my next question. And when the young lady stated about whether or not you agree that the president or the um, attorney general should speak out on issues such as the drug policy. Wouldn't that be the same as when you have a presidential election and they speak about abortion or same-sex marriages, which was really the platform outside of the war in Iraq um, for the 2004 election? Do you agree or disagree? I think government sh can and sh should talk about the issues. I think government should talk about controversies. I think. Um, the more discussion of issues, the more we know about what our government thinks about issues, the better, period. I just want to say the one thing that, since a lot of you are students here, I know, or continuing students, um, uh, that's a really interesting issue here that people in this field of government speech have written a lot about, but there's still some unsettlement, is this transparency concern. That is, there, there isn't yet a holding on the part of the Supreme Court that the government has to be transparent when it speaks. And in fact, there's some suggestion in, in the, um, the uh, where, uh, uh, Johan's case, the uh, beef it's what's for dinner case, that the court doesn't really think it's a requirement. I mean, if you should read the exchange between Scalia and Souter on this, and there are a lot of scholars pushing back on them. I mean, part of Helen's argument is that it has to be transparent. If I recall correctly in the Bush administration, part of the reason they got flack for some of their propaganda was that they were hiding it, right? They were, they were pushing it, but hiding it, making it look like it was a private speaker. So this issue of whether the government has to own up to its own speech is a big one, and I think the court is not yet through grappling with it. I think there's going to be more on that. I hope there is more on that. <laughs> 
Well, and that was my concern about in, in your paper and your talk that you know the it, it kind of creates a gray area in which these limited platforms or limited speech platforms could allow the government to kind of both have its cake and you know, and there I'd want to respond in the way that Mary Jean. I mean, I would like there to be more disclaimers or signs or transparency. I, mean, I want it to be clear when it's the government when the government's just saying. You know, we're opening this for groups, but not the hate groups. You know, and just to be cl to be clear about its role, I think is 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 significant in a lot of these areas. Great, thank you all, and it's been a wonderful <laughs> day. Thank you, Professor Newton. Thank you, Professor Green.